Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the channel here for a little bit of a late edition of Open Mic. I am your host, John Campia, and Open Mic is exactly what it sounds like. The mic is open. The floor is yours. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to discuss in this great big world of movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, and all the good stuff that we enjoy? I am here to serve you. Uh, and it's good to have you guys here. Of course, this is a late edition uh, live stream. We're going on about... Well, four and a half hours later than we normally do. I went to go see a three o'clock screening of Elemental, uh, the new Pixar film. And so uh, we normally do open mic at 3.30. So obviously I couldn't do that. I had to go see Elemental. And I got to tell you guys, I I really liked Elemental. I've got my open, not my open spoiler discussion. I've got my um, quick out of the theater review up on, uh, up on the channel now. You can go and check that out. But... Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was really not the best Pixar film ever made, like not top three or anything, but a really especially good coming off of a disappointment like Lightyear. Coming into this, uh, it was a much needed good win for Pixar from a quality point of view. We'll see what happens uh, with the box office. But yeah, anyway, guys, we are here to take your questions. Now, we usually take questions two way, two ways. The one way we take questions is if people who don't watch live, they can send in questions via the tip link at streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. However, Jonathan is the one uh, who gathers those up. And obviously I'm here alone in the studio tonight. So I don't actually have those questions. Now, if you sent in a tip question over the past 24 hours, don't worry, we still have it, and it will be answered on tomorrow's open mic when we have all those tip questions. So the only way we're taking questions tonight is through Super Chats, and already a bunch of you are fired in a bunch of Super Chats. The Super Chats are still open. I will leave them open for a little while longer here. And uh, and yeah, so let's get into it here, shall we? I, I want to start off tonight just by kind of revisiting something we talked about on the channel and on the podcast earlier today. And by the way, big thank you to everybody who subscribed to the podcast, either on Spotify, where there's also a video version, or on Apple Podcasts, or on any of the other podcasting app of choice. Uh, we are continuing week over week setting new download records for us. More and more people are signing up to the podcast. So thank you so much for making that migration over to the podcast feed, guys. We really appreciate it. But that said, something we addressed earlier today on the show was Flash is opening today. All right, Flash is now open. Um, I love this movie. I, I think the movie is great. Not one of the greatest comic book films of all time, as James Gunn kind of suggested, but still a great, wonderful film that I enjoyed a lot. But the weekend is now here. The question is now front and center. Are people going to go see it? And that is a question that I have simply for the past six months not had an answer to. I just simply don't know. Like normally I have a feeling one way or the other. Sometimes I have a strong conviction one way or the other. But in this case, I have had no clue about whether or not audiences are going to go out to go watch this. Because on the one negative hand, you've got the rapid decline in interest in anything DC related, which again is why James Gunn is rebooting the whole damn thing. And on top of that, you have all the idiotic things Ezra Miller has done to tarnish not just Ezra Miller's reputation, but the reputation of The Flash, the reputation of Warner Brothers, all that kind of stuff. So that's all on one side. But on the other hand, you've got what I think is a truly good product, a, a really wonderful movie. And you got Michael Keaton back as Batman. So you have the nostalgia factor, all kinds of stuff. So I, I honestly, I don't know which side is going to win in that. I just don't know. Um, I think word of mouth is going to help. Now, we talked about the current box office projections earlier today. And right now, at the latest um, article was from yesterday, deadline predicting around the $70 million mark, which is a tiny bit higher, but right around the same opening weekend that Black Adam had. And of course, Black Adam went on to have a very disappointing money losing run, making under $400 million at the box office is what it is. Now, I think Flash will do better than that, even if it does open right around the same amount that 
Black Adam does, I think Flash will do better than Black Adam did because I think it is, number one, a better movie. I think it will get more positive word of mouth and I think it will get more repeat viewings than Black Adam did. But does that mean that I think... Uh, you know, uh, Flash is going to make 450 million. Does it mean I think it's going to make 500 million? Do I think it can get up to 600 million? Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, but it's going to be really, really interesting for me. I'll tell you what, guys, I'm always interested in the box office weekend report. Not because I care about money, but because box office tells us what people are interested in what people are not interested in, what types of marketing campaigns worked, what kind of marketing campaigns did not work, what sorts of movies are interesting audiences and motivating them to go to the theaters, what sorts of movies are not motivating them to go to the theaters, all that kind of stuff. Box office tells us a treasure chest full of information, like really, really good, interesting information. Too many people hear box office and they just go, well, who cares how much money it makes? Well, box office is not about money. I mean, that's not true either. It, it is about money, but it's for us as film fans. It's about this wealth, this riches of information that we get. Now, uh, comparatively, I don't know how many people were in the movie theater today to see Flash because I was in seeing Elemental. I can tell you this. Not a lot of people in my theater to watch Elemental. Now, granted, my screening was a 3 p.m. screening. OK, so granted, 3 p.m. screening much different than a 7 p.m. screening of something else. I totally concede that. Absolutely. But, but, uh, it, there still had to probably, in my 3 o'clock screening, have about 30 people in it. Again, it was a 3 p.m. screening. Parents aren't off work yet to bring their kids or anything like that, so who knows however. Uh, but I don't know how many people were in the flash screening either. I mean, the theater parking lot was not packed. For The Blackening, which I'm, the next movie I'm excited to see is Bl The Blackening. Uh, for The Blackening, Flash, and Elemental. All open, and that movie theater parking lot was not full. Again, the same thing about understanding it was 3 p.m. on a work day. That applies to Elemental, that applies to Flash, that applies to The Blackening, right across the board. So now the big question for me is, once we get this opening weekend box office for The Flash, and, and and again, even right now, even with the $70 million projection, I really don't have a strong feeling about how much it's gonna end up making. Then the next phase of the question will be, am I right about repeat viewings and word of mouth? Because then we're gonna see, I'm very, very curious to see the audience reaction. I'm very curious to see uh, the theaters. Now, I'm expecting a high audience score. And the reason I'm expecting a high audience score is because people who have been turned off by the DC stuff lately, and in particular, people who have been turned off seeing this movie because of Ezra Miller, well, they're not going to see the movie. So the only reactions, you know, when we take a look at the audience scores, the only reactions we're seeing are people who were not turned off by DC's recent failures and not turned off by the Ezra Miller stuff, and they went to go see the movie anyway. So I'm expecting the audience reactions, particularly the early audience reactions, to come out and skew more positive uh, on that. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Now, I'm seeing uh, Ice Ness in the live chat saying 88% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Yeah, but it's still very, very early. Right. Like, I'm going to guess it's still got a very small number of uh, actual respondents. So let me take a look at this flash uh, rotten tomatoes. Let me pull up the score here. So the critic score right now is 67 percent. Yeah, the audience score right now is 88 percent, but that's only counting 250 audience members. Right. Let, let's wait to see what happens when it's a thousand, when it's fifteen hundred, like probably by this time tomorrow, that thing will be into the multiple thousands. And it's going to be interesting to see. Again, I expect it to skew positive for two reasons. Number one, because I think it's a great movie. But number two, because all the people who were turned off this movie because of Ezra or other things didn't go to see it. So we're only going to be hearing people from people who want to see it. Still, I'm expecting a positive take on all this. So we'll see. Um, all right, guys. With that all said, we're going to get into the questions and comments and topics that you guys want to talk about. Uh, you guys have continued to send in Super Chats. We will get to those. Now, before we do, though, we're going to take just a quick second and thank one of the sponsors of this episode and my mobile service provider, our friends at Mint Mobile. 
We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. You guys know that ever since I switched to Mint Mobile, I've been saving almost 70% a month over my old phone plan. For people looking Looking for extra savings this year? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for being my mobile service provider and for sponsoring this episode. All right, guys, let's get now to your questions, shall we? We're going to start things off here with our friend Josh Becker, who writes... Just got out of Elemental, awesome, and I also loved it and liked it more than The Flash, surprisingly. Pixar's first full romance film with immigrant themes, too. I got to tell you, I am so delighted with Elemental. I, listen, I, most movies, you know, I say, hey, I liked it, but I could see why other people didn't like it. Or I say, I didn't like that movie, but I could see why people did, right? I don't know what's not to like about Elemental. Like, see, I, I'm looking, it's not the best Pixar film. It's not a top three Pixar film or anything like that. But I mean, I, I'm watching this movie and I'm thinking, what is there not to like? This is warm and funny and charming. Uh, these are delightful characters with a wonderful immigration story at the heart of it as the child of immigrant, of an immigrant and an immigrant family. I mean, I found a whole lot. I was watching with my wife, who is also the child of an immigrant family. The whole idea, I, I thought a lot about my grandfather and my dad, particularly uh, about there's, there's elements of like people who left their homes to go somewhere else with the promise of not making a better life for themselves, but making a better life for their children and their children's children. And, uh, and as, and by the way, it's, I think it's Pixar's first true romantic comedy and it really, really worked. Um, I, I just thought it was a delightful wonderful, warm, charming movie. And I highly recommend it. Such a great rebound off of the relative disappointment of Lightyear. And uh, it's great to see Pixar get back on his feet that way. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Josh. Donaldo Martinez writes, uh, will you be watching the new Sir David Attenborough nature documentary called Our Planet Part 2? I usually watch a lot of David Attenborough nature stuff, but it's usually in shorter bites on YouTube. Like I, I will often get down these rabbit holes of watching David Attenborough nature, like five to 15 minute long clips on YouTube. That's normally how I watch them. And I will probably continue watching them like that. But his, I can't even see a picture of a cheetah in the wild or a lion or a monkey in a tree or something like that without hearing the voice of David Attenborough in my head. Like his, his will forever be the voice of nature documentary stuff, 100%. All right, thanks for that, Donaldo. Sam Fisher writes, one of two. When Indy takes the sand out of the bag uh, in the idle chamber before the swap, you're talking about in Raiders of the Lost Ark, do you think he takes out too much or not enough? I always thought he made the bag too light because that sort... Uh, of goes with the running theme that Indy isn't perfect. He makes mistakes, gets winded, knocks uh, things down. Oh, no. I, well, I mean, listen, I could be wrong about this. We could ask Steven Spielberg about it. But remember, he's at the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's trying to guesstimate the weight of the idol, right? So the idol is sitting on this pedestal and he's got to try to get the weight right on. So he takes out a certain amount of sand out of the bag puts the bag on the platform as you replace it with the idol, then what happens? The platform sinks. So my assumption is that he didn't take enough sand out. He left the bag too heavy. 
And because the bag was too heavy, it sank the thing down. Now, I might be wrong about that. Maybe Steven Spielberg has uh, maybe Steven Spielberg has made a comment about that. But I've always been under the assumption that Indy took too much sand out of the bag, too much sand out of the bag. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Sam. Next up, we go to Matt Boyle, who writes, I believe Martin Sheen's death scene in The Departed isn't just cinematic. That movie is in my top 10 favorite films of all time. The Departed is a magnificent film. It's among many other things. It's one of the it's the film that made me convinced that Mark Wahlberg could actually act. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Mark guys in the live chat, check the fact check me on this. But I think Mark Wahlberg got an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor in The Departed. Again, it, it was the, the first time that I saw and I thought, oh, my God, this guy can act. Uh, but and the way him and Alec Baldwin play off each other is absolutely phenomenal, absolutely hilarious. And 100 Movie Marathon, Mario, John Am, they're all saying, yes, Mark Wahlberg was nominated for that role. Uh, of course, it's the movie that won Martin Scorsese, his first and still today only Academy Award for Best Director. The funny thing is, and you guys have heard me talk about this. It's not even as good as the original. The Departed is a remake. And I, I'm still surprised today how many people don't realize that The Departed was a remake. The Departed is a story beat for story beat, complete remake of an Asian film called Infernal Affairs, which is my all-time favorite cop movie. Infernal Affairs is my number one all-time favorite cop movie. I think it's even better than The Departed, but The Departed is awesome. I loved it. And uh, I'm glad it won Best Picture at the Academy Awards that year. All right. Next up. Thanks for that, Matt. We go to Christopher uh, Hobgood, who writes, Thoughts on Val Kilmer as Batman. He is my second favorite. I love Val Kilmer. He's not the strongest Batman. I, I kind of liked him as a Bruce Wayne, a very different kind of Bruce Wayne. But I never thought, even though I don't hate his movie, I don't hate that Batman movie. But I, as much as I love Val Kilmer, I never thought he was the best fit for the role. You know what I mean? I never thought he was the absolute best fit the role, for the role, but that's just me. All right, Team Movies writes, happy 10th anniversary to This Is The End. Is that the, the Seth Rogen? James Franco, uh, Jay Barchel, uh comedy? Is that movie 10 years old now? Am I, by the way, in the live chat, guys, am I thinking of the right movie? That's the one where the world's ending, right? Because the world's end is uh, Edgar Wright's movie. But yeah, this, oh my God, I can't believe it's been 10 years since that movie came out. That's a funny film. That is a funny movie, man. I cannot, it's funny because we've had a couple of big 10-year anniversaries. We had the Man of Steel 10-year anniversary. We had the first Last of Us game 10-year anniversary. I think those were both on the same day. And now we've got the 10th anniversary to This Is The End. Wow. Yeah, that was a surprisingly funny. Like for me, the movie goes a little bit off the rails at the end, but I laughed so much watching that movie. I laughed so much watching that movie. It's absolutely crazy funny. All right. Thanks for that, Team Movies. Next up, Paul Sanchez writes, just read that the head of Illumination shot down the Zelda animated movie. Gotta say, I couldn't be happier. Nintendo has partnered with the studio that did Lord of the Rings. How could they not do live Zelda? Well, listen, I, I have to read that myself because I, I had a couple of people message me saying Illumination seems to be suggesting that they're not doing a Legend of Zelda animated film. So that leaves a couple of, I haven't read the story yet myself, so I don't have all the details, but that leaves a couple of options. One option it gives us is that another studio will do the animation for a, a Zelda movie. Another option is that there is no Zelda movie. We know there's going to be a Zelda movie. The third option is that it's going to be a live action. But I don't know what you mean by Nintendo is partnered with the studio that did Lord of the Rings. Warner Brothers is the studio that did Lord of the Rings. And I don't think Nintendo is partnered with... Uh, um, I don't think they're partnered with Warner Brothers at all. Now, 
Uh, Amir is saying in the live chat, Illumination makes mediocre movies. I, I disagree. I think like any studio, they have some weaker movies and they have some stronger movies, but I love their Despicable Me movies. I didn't love Despicable Me 3, granted, but I thought their latest Minion movie was really funny. I thought they did a nice, solid job with the Mario Brother movie. Um, I don't know that they make mediocre movies, to be honest with you. Now, listen, I vote. Nobody's going to be surprised to hear this. I vote for a live action um a live action Zelda movie. I want it to be live action. I absolutely think that um that movie deserves to be live action. Like Mario, that's got to be animated. Mario 100% has to be animated. But I think Zelda should be live action. And again, I think the two most probable possibilities here are that that Nintendo works with another animation studio to do an animated Zelda or they're going to do a live action. I think it's going to be one of the two, but uh, I really am hoping for a live action. I really, really am. All right. Thanks for that, Paul. Next up, uh, James Argento writes, breaking news. Andy Muschietti, the director of The Flash, is set to direct Batman Brave and the Bold, a, a sold Probably meant solid. A solid Flash film and experience directing kids in it makes him a good fit, in my opinion. None of that really matters. The only thing that really matters is Andy Muschietti has proven themselves to be a good storyteller. At the end of the day, whether you have experience doing comic book films or not, remember, James Gunn had no experience doing real comic book films before doing um, uh, the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. None, none of that matters. All that matters is is are is the director you're choosing a good storyteller everything else will work itself out like whether it's action or drama or a comic book film or not a comic book film everything else if you've got a director who is a skilled storyteller that is all you need and i, I remember that's what i got from kevin feige when i was sitting down with kevin feige and and uh, chris pratt and james gunn and i asked kevin feige why James Gunn to direct uh, Guardians of the Galaxy? He had never done anything remotely like this. He had never done anything that was a big budget. And I looked at Kevin Feige and just looked at me and said, because a good storyteller is a good storyteller. And it was like, it's like, it's so simple, but it's such a truth. Andy Muschietti is a really good storyteller and just crushed it with Flash. And clearly James Gunn, the head of the studio, loves the job that Andy did on the flash and said, I want to keep you in the family. I want you to tell this story. And I think telling the story of whatever the new Batman is going to be in this new DCU being in the hands of primarily James Gunn, but now also Andy Muschietti, it makes me feel really good. Um, I, I think this is a really, really good sign. I'm very happy for the selection, and I think it's going to work out really, really well. Like, I, I 100%, I really honestly do. I think it's going to work out great. Okay, next up, we've got uh, Christopher um, uh, Hobgood again writes, when do you think The Boys Season 4 will release? No idea. Obviously, I love The Boys. I love that show. It's one of my favorite shows on TV, but I have absolutely no concept when it comes out. All right, Fangblaze71 writes, uh, just saw Flash, nice, after like 12 years of waiting, and I quite liked it. Not as much as you, but I had a fun time with it. A solid 8 out of 10 in my book. Yeah, listen, one of the things that I said coming out of Flash was, look, all film is subjective. You may like it more than I do. You may not, get, may not like it as much as I do. But what I felt really confident in was, I think people are going to like it. I really think people are going to like it and have a good time with it. And whether that means it's one of your favorites of all time, or whether that means that's ah, forgettable, but I just had a good night out at the movie theaters, whatever. I just really felt very, very good and very, very confident that Flash is a movie that people, are, for the most part, again, all film subjective, everybody will you know, have their own take on it. Some people won't like it and that's perfectly fine. But I really felt after I saw it that most people were gonna enjoy this film. And I'm glad you did. I'm really excited to get out and go watch it again. I think Ray and I are going to try to watch it again before we do our open spoiler discussion on Sunday. In case you didn't know, we are doing a flash open spoiler discussion on Sunday. So keep your eyes, uh, your eyes open for that. But that's what's going to be coming then. And I'm glad you had a good time, Fangblaze. All right, let's take one more. Then we're going to take another quick break here. Fangblaze71 writes, 
I don't know if you'll be impressed or concerned uh, by this, but me and my friends snuck in a two bucket of KFC. We went to see the flash tasted great. Listen, the sneaking food into the movie theater is a tough one for me. Okay. To be honest on the one hand, I get it. Like you want to eat the food that you want to eat. I get that. And concession stand food is is expensive. I get that too. I totally good. I totally do. My wife sneaks food. My brother-in-law, Ray, sneaks in food. No judgment from me. Okay. No judgment. At the same time, uh, they're... They do have a rule at movie theaters. I mean, when you go buy a ticket to a movie theater, you are entering in an honor, kind of an honor system. Like they're saying, hey, you're coming to see a movie in our theater, but you know, we have a rule, don't bring in outside food. And at that point, it's about honor, right? There's an honor system. And compounding the issue with the honor system is that when you realize and when you really think about the fact that movie theaters don't make like that's expensive. We have high demands on our movie theaters, right? The most comfortable seats. We want good screen. We want good picture. We want good sound. We want all that kind of stuff. It's really freaking expensive. And movie theaters don't make money on the movie tickets. They make very, very little money on the movie tickets. They, they keep about a third of what the movie. So if you buy a, a movie ticket for 10 bucks, they only get to keep about three of it. The way they keep the lights on, the way movie theaters pay their staff, the way movie theaters can get the comfortable seats or buy the vacuums that clean up the floor so you have a clean floor to walk on and all that kind of stuff, the way they do all that um, is by the, the food they sell at concession stands. You know, that's, that's how they keep the lights on. That's how the kid who takes my ticket, that's how they pay his salary. So again, for me, it, it's not the same as piracy. I, I don't judge people who bring food into the movie theaters. I don't do anything like that. But for me, it's not something I can do. Um, I, again, it's just, and I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not saying what anybody else should or should not do or what you should or should not think. This is all just, I'm just, you know, telling you what goes on in my head. On the one hand, it's an honor thing because I enter into an agreement when I buy my movie ticket that I'm not supposed to bring in outside food. So I believe there's an honor thing there. And then on top of that, I realize these kids that are in this movie theater working hard and the way they get paid is buy what I buy at the concession stand. And if I don't want to buy anything at the concession stand, that's fine. But I'm, I'm not going to bring in outside food, right? Um, anyway, that's just me. Meanwhile, I'm, Ray is like practically bringing in bags of chilies or bags of Chipotle. Do, 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 do walk in and it's like, eh, eh, what are you going to do? All right. Hey, guys, listen, I'm going to take just another quick minute here. We got two other sponsors of our show this week. Who And, and big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, but two other sponsors of our show this week. We're going to take a second and thank our friends at ExpressVPN and the wonderful folks. You guys should absolutely have them. All of us around here have memberships. Ad Masterclass. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, ExpressVPN. Guys, it is 2023, and online privacy and security has never been more important. You see, every device, phones, computers, tablets, has a unique IP address, which is like an internet phone number and reveals personal information about you. It's super simple for somebody online who knows what they're doing to find your IP address. If you've ever clicked on a sketchy link or opened an email from somebody you don't know, your IP address could become exposed. Now, that's where ExpressVPN has your back. ExpressVPN is an app that hides your real IP address and replaces it with a dummy one, keeping you safe and private. And you don't have to be some kind of techie to use a VPN. Guys, it is so easy to use. Just download the ExpressVPN app on your phone or computer, tap one button to turn it on, and you're protected. And if you like your streaming entertainment, here's the coolest part. They let you choose what country you want your IP address to look like it's coming from. This is incredibly useful because services like Netflix and Disney Plus give you different shows depending on what 
what country you're in. So secure your family's online activity and unlock tons of new shows by visiting expressvpn.com slash campia. Use my link and you can get three extra months free. That's express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash campia. Go to expressvpn.com slash campia to learn more. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn filmmaking from James Cameron himself, you know, the guy who made three of the four biggest films of all time. Improve your writing by taking screenwriting from one of the greatest who's ever done it, Aaron Sorkin. Or maybe learn how to make great comedic content by taking comedy by the one and the only Judd Apatow. And many of you guys know I'm a big poker guy, and I recently got a chance to sit down and watch Daniel Negreanu, one of the greatest poker players in the world, teach poker. It was absolutely fantastic. But guys, whatever you're interested in, there is a class for you with over 180 exclusive classes taught by the instructors you know and love. And you can explore lessons in any order you'd like, across your phone, tablet, Apple TV, computer, and on the go with audio mode. Individual lessons range from about 10 to 15 minutes in length that fit easily into your everyday life. Guys, I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class and as a John Campia show listener you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash Campia now. That's masterclass.com slash Campia for 15% off Masterclass. And thank you to our friends at ExpressVPN and Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. All right guys. With that all down, let's get back to your comments and questions here, shall we? We're going to pick things back up here with uh, Fangblaze again, who writes in, Is it just me, or are you getting tired of hip-hop music being played over big, important action scenes? Like That was one moment that really pulled me out of the flash when the pop song came on. No, I don't, I don't get tired of it at all. That's like saying, do I get tired of some classic rock song playing in a Guardians of the Galaxy movie? No, do I get tired of some big orchestra music playing over something no i if listen the right song whether it's classic rock or modern pop or hip-hop or orchestral music or whatever the right music match with the right scene works and so no I, in general do i get tired of hip-hop songs playing action scenes i don't i know the the scene you're thinking about for me it really worked like, I, I thought it really, really worked. That's just me. But, I mean, seriously, like, the right song that matches the cadence of the energy of an action scene can really, really work well. And sometimes that's, like, Zeppelin with the immigrant song and Thor. Or, or whatever, like, right? Or it's, like, a good hip-hop song or an Eminem song or whatever. Like... The right song matched the right cadence of a particular action scene can really heighten it. And I don't care, like I said, if it's classic rock, hip hop, or whatever. If it works, it works. For me personally, the scene you're talking about in the movie, I think it worked. But it's a completely subjective thing, obviously. If it didn't work for you, totally get it. Uh, all I can say is I can just speak from my own experience with it, Fang Blaze, which is for me personally, it really did work. But yeah, you know, whatever. That's just me. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on it, man. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Hung Vu writes, the problem I have with Man of Steel is the maybe is the maybe scene. Completely agree with the logic, but still Jonathan said it to an eight-year-old teenager a uh, teenager would be better. Completely disagree. 100%, 100%, 100% disagree. Jonathan Kent, Pa Kent, in that moment was, was confronted with a very legitimate question. And I don't think he was eight at the time. I don't think he was eight. But he was confronted with a very direct question to a very direct situation. Clark decided to save the lives of the kids in the school bus, but in doing so, risked to expose himself. And when confronted with the question, what, was I just supposed to let them die? Jonathan Kent, and this is what this is part of the thing that is so brilliant, because Man of Steel, in many places, avoids the typical cliche, clean Hollywood written answer, right? Because the typical clean, cliche perfect people, Hollywood written answer. That would be the dad going, well, of course not. No, I wouldn't want you to let them die. I just hope you'll be a little more careful, right? Nah, this was a father. 
And guess what? Most I'm not a father myself, but I know a lot of dads. And I know my dad. And you know your dad. Would your dad easily in the in a snap of would most fathers in the just snap of the fingers sacrifice 10 other kids to save their own kid you're damn right they would that's what most fathers would do i don't think most fathers would say that's what you should do but caught in that moment a parent with a choice of either my child being killed or harmed or in harm's way or 10 other children 10 other children right and to me it is that part of human honesty of Man of Steel that really, really worked for me. And I love the fact that Pa Kent wasn't BSing around with his kid. and Because he, he was confronted with a tough question. What? I, I'm just supposed to let them die? And he doesn't know what to say. And he looks down, and I love Costner's performance in that moment. As he looks down, he's like, maybe. And it's that level, it's, it's that honesty being brought into a typical comic book movie that to me that elevates the movie that elevates the movie to another level instead of your paint by numbers oh this is where the dad's supposed to say no of course not son save people they get paint by numbers insert square into square hole little bit yeah they could have done that they could have taken the easy predictable nice safe way out but instead they decided to make it with honesty and I think that was important, too, because it was a part of understanding the character of Clark Kent in that movie, that this is what he was raised with. He understands that. See, that that scene is. There's no disconnecting that scene from the scene later in the movie where Clark has to choose to honor his father's wishes and allow him to die to maintain his secret because his whole life, starting on that moment and that conversation with Jonathan Kent when he was a kid is undetachable from then the decision he had to make to honor what it was his father was trying to teach him and honor what it was his father wanted by allowing his own dad to die to maintain the secret because he knew the world wasn't ready. And that to me is a part of the brilliance of Man of Steel. That ain't a weakness in it. And again, I'm not saying your theory or your opinion about it is any less valid than mine. Not at all. I'm, you ask me the question, so I'm telling you why this is for me. Okay. I'm not saying it has to be this way for you. I'm just explaining why this is for me, but that's part of the thing that makes man of steel another level above so many other comic book movies. Um, is that that commitment to character development, that commitment to a human kind of honesty in a fantasy comic book film, and that's why Man of Steel is just, quite frankly, so far superior to most comic book movies ever made. Not all of them. Not all of them. But most of them. And, and that scene, to me, while I respect it didn't work for you, that scene for me is one of the reasons why it is a superior comic book film. Um, is, is that level of, of depth and that level of character work and that level of honesty. And I loved it because it's, it's the type of stuff you don't see many comic book filmmakers have the courage to put into their films. But, you know, again, that's just my opinion that I'm sharing with you, Hung. I appreciate you sharing yours, man. All right. Tim Platt writes. Going to my local con this weekend, nice. And I'm really looking forward to meeting Billy D. Williams. Damn, I would too. Uh, now that you've met Weird Al, who would you most want to meet that you haven't had the chance? There's only one guy. Well, there's two. There's two. One for me, one for Ann. There is only two people in the business I haven't met um, that I would actually really like to meet. For me, it's Steven Spielberg. I've never met Steven Spielberg. I've met everybody. Hell, I've been in George Lucas's office. I have met everyone. And the one guy who is my all-time favorite filmmaker is the one guy I've never met, uh, which is Steven Spielberg. I've had a rule for myself for, for the better part of the last year that I no longer accept any press invitations to stuff. And I don't go to press screenings. I don't go to uh, press events. I don't go to junkets. I don't do any of that stuff. But even I must admit 
that were I to get one that included the opportunity to meet Steven Spielberg, I I would probably take that one. I would probably that's probably the only thing I can think of that I would break my rule for. But I I would I would probably take that one to to go meet Steven Spielberg. The only other person I haven't really met, although I I sat 15 feet from him while he was performing on stage, is Tom Hanks. I've never met Tom Hanks. Um, and that is my wife's all time number one favorite celebrity is Tom Hanks. And I am desperate, desperate to find a way somehow, some way to get and to meet Tom Hanks. I mean, that would be, that would be like the ultimate I'm good for the rest of my life with Anne kind of move. If I could get, if I could somehow introduce Anne to Tom Hanks, I'm forever in the good books. I forgot to take the garbage out. No problem. I introduced Anne to Tom Hanks. I'm good. I, 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 I bought a new sports car for myself without talking to her, which I would never do, but bought a new sports car for myself without talking to her. No problem. You introduced me to Tom Hanks. I'm good. There really isn't much I couldn't get away with for the rest of my life. If I were to introduce Anne to Tom Hanks, but those are the two that I would really love to meet. Anyway, have fun at your con, man. And I hope you have a really good time meeting Billy D. Williams. That's awesome. Dude's a legend. All right, next up. Uh, it's Zanti. Sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you so much, it's Zanti, for supporting us on that level. Who writes, I just returned from the theater. My IMAX theater in New Jersey was packed. Great movie, actually. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess you're talking about Flash and not uh, not Elemental. Um, I'm glad you saw it. And I'm glad you saw it. Like I expect... I expect tonight the premium screens, the prime Dolby screens, the IMAXs, I expect all those are going to be sold out. But that's not the question. That's not what's going to determine the box office. What's really going to determine the box office um, is do the other theaters sell out? Do the regular theater sell out? And that's the one I'm waiting to find out. But I'm really glad you enjoyed The Flash. I cannot wait to watch it again. There's a scene in this movie involving a hospital that is so bonkers great. Like, so great. Uh, but there are many scenes in this movie that are really, really wonderful. I'm glad you had a chance to watch it, man. And I'm glad you got to watch it with a full house because there's nothing like watching a great movie with a big crowd of people. That's one of the best things ever, and I'm glad you're able to do that uh, with a movie like Flash. All right, next up, we got uh, Nikhil uh, Shirsat, who writes, uh, was excited for Flash for years, so disappointed. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Apparently, you didn't like the film. Hey, listen, again, that's the beautiful thing about movies, man. They're subjective. It's just because a lot of us liked it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like it. And I'm really sorry that you didn't. That sucks. But, oh, well, hopefully the next movie you see, you'll enjoy, man. I really hope you do. All right. A. Marcellus writes, I live in New York and got tickets for our Comic-Con. This will be around my 15th. Wow. And my wife's first. Ewan McGregor and Chris Evans are showing up. Is this NYCC? Is this New York City Comic-Con that you're talking about? Or is it a different Comic-Con? New York City Comic-Con. Help me out in the live chat, guys. But New York City Comic-Con usually happens around October. I want to say it happens around October. Amar Sells is saying in the live chat that, yes, it's New York City Comic-Con. Um... So you can get your tickets now for that? Yeah. Oh, and AMR will see. Yep. October 12th through 15th. Okay. Yeah. I have never been to New York City Comic Con. Never been. I've always wanted to go, but damn, it's expensive. Not that the not that Comic Car, a uh, Comic Con is expensive, but flying from Los Angeles to New York, getting hotel rooms down there and then having to eat. And I mean, it's, it's an expensive endeavor, but I, and it's like a five hour flight, but I would absolutely love to go to that sometime. Anyway, I hope you have a great time at it, A. Marcellus. I love that this is going to be your 15th year. All right. Next up, we got uh, Eiffel K who writes, any blade news? No, the only blade news right now is that there's a writer's strike and they don't have a script. And they can't develop anything on the script until the writer strike is done. Uh, I mean, it really sucks, but they just hired a brand new writer the day before the writer strike went on. And now the writer can't write. So they have no script. <laughs> so until there's a script, they can't shoot a movie. They can't do anything. So there is no Blade news right now. 
Uh, nor is there probably going to be any Blade news for a while. Probably going to be a while. All right, Fangblaze 71 writes, After years of suffering through what became a horrible Flash show after season three, the movie was a much-needed win for Flash fans, in my opinion. I don't agree that it was all horrible after season three. I mean, I, I think it still had a couple of good seasons in it. Um, I did fall off it a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I, but you listen, you know, I got to tell you what, for me, Flash was playing with house money. I was in poker terms. I was free rolling with Flash because I thought Flash was going to be a horrible show, period. I just thought the show was going to be a bad show. I thought it was a bad idea to make it. And then I actually really enjoyed the show, especially in the earlier years, especially in the earlier years. But I still appreciated some of the latter stuff, too. Um, so for me, it was all just house money. It was just all free rolling with it. Like every episode of The Flash that I liked was bonus because I never thought the show was going to be good in the first place. Um, and listen, I have heard a lot of debate and controversy lately about which is better, the, the CW Flash, the movie version of Flash. And by the way, it is not a Grant Gustin versus Ezra Miller discussion, right? Somebody wrote into my show the other day, asked, who does Flash better, Grant Gustin or Ezra Miller, right? And what I said is, that's a false question because Grant Gustin and Ezra Miller are not playing the same character. But John, they're both playing Barry Allen, the Flash. Yes, but the Barry Allen Flash in CW is a very different Flash and a very different Barry Allen than the Barry Allen and Flash that they've written for the big screen. Those are two very different characters. Much in the way that Jack Nicholson's Joker was a very different character than the Joker that, say, um, from a Suicide Squad, right? Jared Leto's Joker is Joker. Jack Nicholson's Joker is Joker, but they're two completely different characters. Right. So the question is not, did Grant Gustin play Flash better than Ezra Miller? The, the, the two actors were playing two completely different characters. Grant Gustin was playing a CW version of Flash. Ezra Miller was playing a big screen movie version of Flash, and they were very, very different. So the real question when somebody asks, do you think Grant Gustin did it better or do you think Ezra Miller did it better? The real question you're asking is, did you prefer the Flash character the way they were written in CW, or did you prefer the Flash character the way they were written on the big screen? Uh, it's really not a, uh, it's really not a Grant Gustin versus Ezra Miller thing. But, um, but personally, I prefer. I really like the Flash TV show. I do, but I, I would take this Flash movie over the Flash TV series. That's just me, and, and I mean that is no disrespect to Grant Gustin, who was great. Or the Flash TV show, which for a while was really great and I enjoyed. But I think the movie is better than the show was. I mean, I, I, again, everybody's going to have a different answer for that. But for me personally, I thought the movie was better than the show. And that's not me taking anything away from the show at all. All right. Thanks for that, Fangblaze. Next up, Tim Platt writes, as a football soccer fan myself, I'm curious as to which show, if any, raised your interest in the game more, Ted Lasso or Welcome to Wrexham? Welcome to Wrexham. Ted Lasso is, the, the funny thing about Ted Lasso is there's very little soccer in Ted Lasso, right? There's, a, it's, it is really a character show. There's very little soccer in it. That being said, Welcome to Wrexham is, the whole thing is about soccer. And I know it drives my international audience crazy when I say soccer, but I'm sorry. That's what we for, we refer to it here as. Um, so like way more. And Anne got me and her tickets. We're going to go see Wrexham play Manchester United in San Diego next month. Uh, Wrexham and Manchester United are having an exhibition game or as they call it in soccer, a friendly uh, in San Diego next month. And we're going to go watch. Um, yeah, and I'm not a big soccer fan, but at the, one of the reasons I love sports so much is at the heart of it, sports are the most real and most authentic human stories, like about overcoming great obstacles, chasing dreams, uh, having an adversary that's almost impossible to overcome. 
it's it's real drama it's real stories and that's one of the reasons i love it and now that i'm hooked on the story of wrexham and of course it's owned by my channel's number one supporter ryan reynolds and his company men mobile uh, but no that was completely side i love the show and so i'm so emotionally invested in this team now that uh i'm very excited i'm gonna go watch them play against you know, maybe the world's most famous soccer team, Manchester United. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, being a part of that and seeing that. But yeah, definitely, Tim, welcome to Wrexham, did more to get me interested in soccer, even more so than Ted Lasso, because Ted Lasso doesn't actually have a lot of soccer in it. All right. Uh, Fangblaze 71 writes, might be a hot take, but I love the Flash's suit. Um, I haven't heard anybody complaining. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not hearing it, but I haven't heard anybody really complaining about the Flash's costume in the movie. Uh, you know me, I don't care about costumes at all. I mean, I can think a costume looks good and I can think a costume looks bad, but whether a costume is good or bad, it doesn't make the movie any better or worse to me. So I really don't care about the costume as long as it looks like the Flash. Okay. That looks like the Flash. Totally good with me. Uh, but yeah, I haven't heard anybody say they haven't liked it myself, Angley. So I don't think that's necessarily a hot take. All right. Next up, Donaldo Martinez writes, Good job pronouncing my name. Uh, a good job pronouncing my name right. Most people get it wrong. Hey, listen, dude, I'll tell you what. As somebody with my last name, where is it? Right there. Nobody ever says my name right the first time. And, and why should they? Come on. Have you ever met anybody with my last name? Honestly, have you ever even heard of anybody with my last name? A lot of people don't even realize it's Italian. Most people, when they try to say my last name, they say the French variation of it with a U on the end and they say Campo. So even though they read that it says C-A-M-P-E-A -E and there's no U, a lot of people will naturally just try to say Campo or, or something like that. Um, but but most people read it and they they have no idea. They can't be like a lot of people say can't be um, can't be a or something like that, hardly anybody ever in my life has looked at my name and said, Campia. It's like, it never happens. It's very rare. And, and by the way, John is not actually my real first name. Although, I mean, it's real in a way. I was named after my grandfather uh, who came over on the boat from Italy. And my grandfather's name is Giovanni, which is, that's my real name is, is Giovanni. I was named after my grandfather. But in Canada... My grandfather went by John because that's what a lot of immigrants did. They took on, you know, Canadian names. They took on all that kind of stuff. So that's why sometimes you'll hear people, um, sometimes you'll hear friends of mine refer to me as Geo. Sometimes that's why you might see some people write in and say, hey, Geo. And when they write that G-I-O, that's them calling me by my real first name. Anyway, side track, whatever. Mm. Is what it is. Okay. Um, so I'm, I get you, Donaldo. I get you. I totally get you. All right. Next up, we go to Fangblaze who writes, you got to aim your camera a bit higher up. Uh, we can't see Henry's face. Such a shame. You give him all this praise and hide his glorious face. Well, I mean, Hey, at least he's, he's in here. At least Henry's in here. I mean, listen, I, I mean, not as much as star Wars, but I really love man of steel, man. <laughs> I love Henry Cavill as Superman. I totally do. All right. Uh, next up, we got Cus Cinema writes, just saw Flash, loved it. Kara was a standout and I immediately got her Funko. I bet that. Uh, I did, I I get it if they don't, but I hope Sasha uh, Kaye, I think is the way they say they pronounce her name. Sasha Kaye is in the Supergirl movie. I don't know if they're planning on using her in the Supergirl movie or not, to be honest with you. Um, but I'll tell you what, I went into the movie not knowing what to expect from Supergirl. And again, we're not going to get any spoiler stuff here, spoiler discussion on Sunday. But um, I'll tell you what, I was thrilled with the Supergirl character in this movie. Absolutely thrilled. I mean, Michael Keaton as Batman stood out more. It is Ezra's leading uh, role, but 
but I thought she was fantastic. I really did. I loved that character. Absolutely loved the character. And I wasn't sure that I would going into it, to be honest with you. All right. And our final question of the evening comes to us from Boon Lean Tan, who writes, um, have you... Have, okay, let me try this again. You seen What We Do in the Shadow Season 5 trailer yet? I have not. That is one of my favorite shows on TV. What We Do in the Shadows is such a brilliant show. I love it so much. Uh, but no, I have not seen the Season 5 trailer yet. I didn't know it was out yet. I cannot wait to go back and watch it again. Um, Daytona, human bartender. I... I so passionately love this show. All oh, Nadja Nandor. I, I cannot wait to get back to it and watch it again. So I didn't even know the season five trailer came out until you just let me know that right now. So I cannot wait to go see that. All right, guys. And that will do it for today's installment of Open Mic. Thank you so much for joining me, guys, here on this late edition of the show. Glad you guys came along and joined me for this. Don't forget, make sure you go and subscribe to our podcast. The John Camp Show podcast goes out every day. Find it on your favorite podcasting app of choice, particularly on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, where we also put up a free video version as well. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We put up daily news videos and all that kind of good stuff. And, of course, the show will be back again tomorrow. We hope you guys will come and join us for that there so that'll do it for me for tonight guys thank you so much for being here my name's john campia and until next time my friends bye bye